Welcome to the Beamsville Church of Christ online ministry. This week's message is titled, After the Resurrection. The scripture reading is John 14, 1-10. Thank you to Rhonda, Ed, and Don for being part of the video. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And thank you for coming today. And a special good morning for this great, big, long front row. Look at them all. Bunches of them. We've got some really special people who are having birthdays this week. One of them being our friend Jonathan. One of them being our friend Gloria. And Barb, your Barb? Barbara, your, okay, and Barb. And Sherry and Ernie are having an anniversary. Please check your mailboxes for a survey about Wednesday evening meetings. Completed surveys should be returned to the elders or put in the donation box. Okay, and Diane's neighbor, Reen, we've talked about her different times over the last while. She's uh, in the hospital now. She has pneumonia and possibly has had a heart attack. Uh, so we need to, to think about her and keep her in our prayers and keep Diane in our prayers. And let us pray. Dear God in heaven, thank you so much for the opportunity we have to be here today with people of like mind and like spirit, and, and we pray that, that your spirit will control our lives, and we pray that you will fill us with faith no matter what our circumstances are, that, that we will have the faith to be able to, to face whatever, whatever we're facing and whatever is ahead of us, and we pray that you will fill us with your knowledge and that, that we will know how to to best serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. There are several times during the year when it's appropriate to give gifts. That'd be right. So we've had some people who are having a birthday. Well, that's a time to celebrate another year. And Christmas time, probably appropriate to give and receive gifts. Now, you folks, do you like get gifts at Christmas time? Yeah, we see a few nods. Yeah. How about the rest of you? Well, that's, that's okay, right? You like to receive. It's a good thing, right? Well, in Romans chapter 5, there's an interesting section beginning in verse 15. It reads as follows. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died through the one person's trespass, much more surely have, have the grace of God and the free gift of, in the grace of that one person, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the effect of one person's sin, for the judgment following one's, one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses, brings justification. If because of one person's trespass, death exercised dominion over that one, much more surely will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness exercise dominion in life through the one person, Jesus Christ. Well, we participate in giving gifts. I often would tell students, you know, I, I give my wife a gift of, ro- of uh, flowers every day. And they would kind of look at me with some weird bewilderment. And I said, yes, I give her tulips every day. But sometimes the gifts that are the most important gifts are the ones that are unexpected, random Well, this passage talks about the free gift. The free gift is Jesus Christ. So we've been singing about low in the grave he lay, but up from the grave he arose. So this resurrection that took place a week ago today as we celebrated it, resurrection for what? Resurrection, to be grateful for this free gift that we have from in Jesus Christ that is, allows us to know him 
and to come close to him and to know God to some degree and to understand God to some degree. And this can be powerful in our lives. Can you imagine the trajectory of your life without Jesus? I can't even imagine it. I can tell you I would have never moved to Beamsville if it wasn't for Jesus. I would have never taught at Great Lakes for 41 years if it wasn't for Jesus. You see, we have been resurrected, and it's as, we, as we think about baptism, dying, being buried in the water, and coming out of the water new, spirit-filled, for what? To serve him, to abide in him. And this abiding puts away fear. It puts away a lot of things that can come up in our lives. Surely there's going to be trouble. But surely, with Jesus' help, those troubles aren't so troublesome. And as we've sung in death, I don't know about you, but I, I want to live as long as I can, but I'm not afraid of death because of Jesus. So as we participate in communion today, we think about that broken body. We think about that blood that cleanses us from our sin. And this time of year, we think about resurrection. And this gift that we have been given surely needs to be unwrapped and examined and appreciated and be thankful for, just like the gifts that we receive in other ways in our lives. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, for this sacrifice that you have made to send yourself to this world, to participate in the human experience and to teach us how and what you're about and what you have expected of us, and to conquer this sin that's in our lives, to give us hope and renewal in this life, to be your people, to be your hands, to be your feet, to be your, your, your uh, words, and to be your love. To be these things in our lives, we pray that you might bless us to this end. But as we pause now, we remember our dear Savior, his broken body and his shed blood that makes this gift free and available to all of us if we only accept and believe. And it's in his name we pray at this time with thanksgiving. Jesus Christ, amen. The reading this morning is from John chapter 14, verses 1 to 10. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, so that you, may al you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how could we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that'll be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work.
Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, last week, we talked about the resurrection and how powerful the resurrection was. But have you ever wondered what happens after the resurrection, after Jesus leaves? And it's profound that we can look at these words. Uh, Peter stands up and he's addressing the crowd and he says, In these last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit and they will prophesy. Prophesy basically is preaching. It's declaring the word of the Lord. And so this is what actually happens. At Pentecost, people hearing all this, wondering what all of this means, and it's, it's powerful. He says, men and women of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which he did among you, as you yourselves know. He was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, for it was impossible for death to keep its grasp on him. And that's our promise. It's impossible for death to keep its grasp on us. One day, we'll all be together with the Lord, eye to eye, face to face with all of our loved ones. We have this promise. So what do we do until that happens? How do we live our lives? And so we go through what's called the book of Acts. Interesting, these different actions of people speaking, proclaiming the word of the Lord. And there's no way that we can go through all the book of Acts, of course, today. But I just want to read a couple of scriptures. And if you want to follow along with me, you can, but it's not necessary because it's just a picture of putting ourselves there. I mean, just imagine for a moment, if you were there at the crucifixion of Jesus and you walked away from it, and then all of a sudden you saw somebody coming towards you who was a friend of yours, but I was at your funeral last week. How did you come back? You see, when Jesus was raised from the dead, it wasn't just Jesus that was raised from the dead. When he was raised from the dead, there were many holy people who had died who were also raised from the dead. It was magnificent, incredible. And so what happens? Well, we, we want to know more about this. We want to know more about this Jesus. And so when Peter is writing the book of Acts, and Paul also mentions lots of different things in this book, it's this, so what do we do now? Well, in chapter 3 of Acts, it says this, Now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets saying that the Christ would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins might be wiped out. And then he says, he must remain in heaven for a while until one day he will come, listen, and restore everything. The restoration of all things is a promise from Jesus to you and me. Isn't that incredible? And so people are trying to understand this, and they're trying to understand what, what do we do now, and where do we go? And so there's this man whose name was Saul, who later becomes the great Apostle Paul, and you've heard this story many, many times, but if you haven't, I'll just read it very quickly. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in, in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, Christians, 
whether men or women, he may take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. (laughs) This Saul, who becomes Paul, who writes most of the New Testament, at one time was completely against Christianity. And as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul asks, who are you, Lord? Then he says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you'll be told what to do. Many of you remember The rest of the story where he goes in, he hears the word of the Lord even more. He's baptized. The one who said he would never believe in Jesus is now preaching Jesus as hard and as long as he can. It's amazing what Jesus can do in changing our hearts. So even though we're reading a book that was written thousands of years ago, it still is so new. It has reference to us every single day. And then it says the church grew throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria, enjoying a time of peace. For the longest time, Christians were just being totally persecuted, but now they can join this wonderful group of people coming together. And it says there was encouragement, and the Holy Spirit helped people to know about God, and they grew in number as well as growing in their faith. And so Peter begins to speak, and he says this, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but he accepts men and women, boys and girls, from every nation who believes in him and who fears him. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, telling the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. Question, how peaceful have you been feeling? With this pandemic, there's been a lot of disruption. People struggling emotionally, sometimes intellectually, in a lot of ways, maybe even, maybe even spiritually. Go back 2,000 years ago, and he wants us to remember this. The peace of God is for all of us. And so this gathering together of people coming together, we want to preach this. We want, we want to declare this, that Jesus is Lord not just for a person or a couple of people, but as Lord of all. And so there's this, there's several unique things that take place. There were Jew and Gentile who really wouldn't even walk on the same street together. Now they come together as one, which wasn't the easiest thing for them to do. So the apostles and the elders gathered together and had lots of discussions about what should be happening. And then he says this, Brothers and sisters, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and that they would believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as the Holy Spirit has been given to us. God made No distinction between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Do we want to have greater faith? One of the ways of having greater faith is asking God to help us have greater faith. That was their prayer. They were amazed at all of these things happening. And it seemed like the disciples then were saying, give us some greater faith. Help us to be stronger. We were always so fearful. Help us to be content. Help us to grow. Help us to declare the word of the Lord. And then it says, the whole assembly became quiet 
as they listened to Paul and Barnabas telling about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them, the Gentiles, not just the Jews. And when they finished, James spoke up and said, Brothers, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God first showed his concern by taking them from Gentiles, a people for himself. These Jewish people who become Christians and now these Gentile people who become Christians, all together as one. And isn't that a beautiful understanding of that even though we sit here with what, 70 people, 60 or 70 people, we are part of millions. People who are in heaven waiting for us. People who are all over the world praying for us as we pray for people all over the world. And so people just started reaching out. And so you, you, we have books in the Bible like the province of Galatia, church in Philippi, various churches all throughout the land at that particular time, all trying to come together as one. And one of the joy that they've ever experienced is when Peter would come by or James would come by or Paul would come by and, and help us to understand even more. And that's part of our worship, isn't it? Coming together every week to just say, can you just give me a positive word? Something that will be helpful. Something that I can share with someone else. Make their week better. Make our week better. Make our life better. And so here's the message in Acts chapter 15, where Jew and Gentile are trying to come together. And it wasn't easy. The words of the, proper, of the, of the prophets are in agreement, where he says, after this I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild, and I will restore it, that the remnant of men and women may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things. See, for years, the Jewish people, even the Jewish Christians, just thought the Gentiles were a different group altogether. They don't eat the same food. They don't think the same way. Completely different. And then, and then, the work of the Holy Spirit gathers all the people to come together as one if they wish. And so letters are sent out. I mean, how, how do you do it back then? You can't just send an email. Uh, you know, people scattered all over Israel in different parts of Europe and Asia. What do we do with all of that? We don't even know all the churches that existed back then, just we know some. How do you, how do you get this message out? So they hired mailmen, <laughs> prophets. We'll take the message. And it says, what they read, they were glad for the encouraging message. Judas and Silas, who themselves were prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the brothers and sisters. And after spending some time there, they were sent off by the brothers with a blessing of peace to send off again. So these people that were sent by the apostles, they went. And then they came back. And they whispered to other people, you know, I just, I just got back from doing this. There's this little group of people over there. They need help. Would you go? And would you go here? And would you go here? And would you go there? We don't know all these preachers and prophets in the New Testament. One day, I hope that we'll get to see them, that this book of Acts is this encouragement of how we can live post-resurrection in reality today. And so... In Acts chapter 17, when Paul is preaching, and a lot of people don't accept his message, here's what he says. In verse 24, The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and the Lord of earth. He does not live in temples built by hands, and he's not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men and women life and breath and what? Everything else. From one man, he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth 
And he determined the exact time set up for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men and women would seek him and perhaps reach out for him, find him, though God is not far from each one of us. For in him we live, we move, we have our own being. Incredible that God has given us this gracious, precious gift. So what happens after the resurrection? The same word is going to be expressed over and over again all throughout the book of Acts. People along the road declaring the word of the Lord to others. It wasn't so much, we're going to have a, a gospel meeting at a church. There was no such thing. It was just people gathering together, coming together as one, sharing. And, and, and all of a sudden we come across wonderful people, people like Aquila and Priscilla and other people in the Bible. And then in Acts chapter 19, Paul is on his way to Ephesus. And it says, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Do you, have you received the Holy Spirit? And they said, we didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. And so Paul said, what baptism did you receive? And they said, John's baptism, a baptism where it's just repentance of sin. And so they encouraged them more. And they were baptized into Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and our absolute dedication to the Lord by doing the same thing in our baptism. Death, burial, and resurrection. Not physical death. I mean, how many of us have seen a baptism? How many of us have been baptized? It's precious. Somebody coming into the water, saying, I, I want to be a Christian, and so someone helping him in the water, the question that's usually asked is, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? <laughs> I've been a preacher for a long time. Some of the answers to that question is unique. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? And one person said, I sure do, and so do you, and he dunked my head underneath the water. Just so excited. She just didn't know what else to do. She wasn't trying to be rude or unfaithful or anything, just... She's just so happy. And that encouragement is for all of us. We remember our baptism. And if you're here today and you've never been baptized, it's something that you may want to consider. It represents the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ Jesus, blessing us. And so all the way through this book of Acts, they're, they're encouraging one another. And toward the end of the book, and I'll just conclude with this, in Acts chapter 26, it says, on one of the journeys I was going on to Damascus, this is Acts chapter 26 and verse 12, on one of these journeys I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. At noon, O king, I was on board. This is talking to the king himself. Paul, he's imprisoned so many times being in prison. He's always having to defend himself, and here he's defending himself. About noon, O king, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And then I asked, who are you, Lord? These are just words. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now, get up on your feet. I have, I have prepared to appoint you as a servant and as a witness that you have seen, and I will show you, and I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles, and I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn from the darkness. And so when Paul does all of this, he's baptized into Christ Jesus. He couldn't help himself but preach and preach the word of the Lord. And so let me just finish up with the end of the book of Acts. After all of these journeys, after all of the preaching, after all these conversions, how, how does this end up? I think it's pretty unique. So in Acts chapter 28, 
I'm just going to start reading in verse 23. They arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. From morning until evening, he explained and declared to them the kingdom of God and tried to convince them about Jesus by the law of Moses and the prophets. If you're not going to hear me, what about the prophets? What about the law? It's all coming together as one. Verse 24, some were convinced by what he said, but others, and it's true today, would not believe. They disagreed among themselves, and they began to leave after Paul made his final statement. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your forefathers when he said through Isaiah the prophet, go to this people and say, you will be ever hearing but never understanding, you will be ever seeing but never perceiving. From this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes, otherwise they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. And that's true to this day. Some will just say, no. But then there are others who will say, I can't believe what a special promise and gift God has allowed us to have through Jesus Christ. Therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. And then it says, for two whole years, Paul stayed in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. And then these last words, which I think is precious, boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. May that also be true of us. Boldly and without hindrance, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching people about the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You're all going to go home and you're going to have a meal. And before long, you're going to be hungry again. And without that meal you would die. This is a much better meal. The more you eat, the more you want to eat, and you will never ever get too full, and you will never be hungry again. But if you stop eating, it won't be long until you die. And so it's it's a little bit different. Thank you, God, so much for your word, and thank you, God, for for your son and for, for the blessings that we have and for the privilege that we have of being able to study your word and to read your word and to grow more like you because of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching or listening. The Beamsville Church of Christ meets at 4900 John Street, Beamsville, Ontario. Scripture quotations marked NIV taken from the Holy Bible, New International Version, NIV, copyright 2011 by Biblica, Inc. Used by permission. All rights reserved worldwide. Scripture quotations marked NRSV are from the New Revised Standard Version Bible. Copyright 1989, National Council of the Churches of Christ in the United States of America. Used by permission. All rights reserved worldwide. You can find out more about the congregation on our Facebook page or at beamsvillechurchofchrist.ca.